the history of the Jewish people had various uh, periods. Um, one of these was the, uh, uh, one of these periods was the time of the judges. And I think you're familiar with this. Uh, the time of the judges was a time after Joshua had brought the people into the promised land, uh, but God had not yet anointed any kings over them. Uh, each tribe lived in its designated area, has it had its own tribal and family leaders. And at times when the entire nation of tribes was threatened by an outside force or enemy, God would raise up a particular man, at one time it was a woman, uh, to protect or judge or exhort the nation. Uh, and these individuals were called judges. Samuel, for example, was a judge. Uh, so was Samson a judge of Israel? Well, this morning I want to talk about another one of these judges. His name was Gideon and how his story provides certain principles that pertain to our situation today as Christians living through this particular period of time. Now, God had promised his people when they left Egypt that if they obeyed him, he would bless them. And if they disobeyed him, he would punish them in a variety of ways. We read about that in Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28. And I read, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today, and the curse, if you do not listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I am commanding you today by following other gods which you have not, uh, which you have not known. Now, this was a special warning against worshiping false gods, which the Jews were in a habit of, of, of doing. God also promised that if they repented and called on him, he would forgive them and save them from their enemies and their problems. These two promises framed much of the history of the Jews from this time forward. You see, they would, they would begin well. They had all kinds of good intentions, but would soon fall into idolatry and then into immorality as a consequence. And then God would punish them in some way, you know, allowing foreign nations to attack them or he would send natural catastrophes to befall them. Then when the Jews had enough, they would cry out to God and he would send someone to, to save them, to rescue them. Someone who was a religious or a military or political leader to bring the people together and to help them uh, persevere in trial, defeat their enemy. And this cycle just continues over and over again through the Old Testament. Well, as I said, these people were called judges and Gideon was one of these judges. And his story is found in Judges, chapter six to eight. So I want you to open your Bibles to chapter six in Judges. And read along with me, please. Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So okay, that's where we are in the cycle. They've been doing okay and whoops, now you know, the story picks up. Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. The power of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites and the sons of the east and go against them. So they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel as well as no sheep, ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come in like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable and they came into the land to devastate it. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian and the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. So you see the cycle here, they were doing okay and then they fall into idolatry and then they fall into immorality and God is now punishing them by allowing other nations to come in and devastate them and a particular kind of cruelty 
just at harvest time, just at time when the, you know, cat, uh, the sheep were you know, having the little sheep and so on and so forth, just at that time, you know, the enemy would come in, they'd sweep up all of the new animals, they'd take all of the harvest, they'd take everything, the fruit, everything, and, and then they'd leave. And so they were beginning to be pretty discouraged at, at, at the seventh year of this type of, of treatment. So what do they do? They cry out to the Lord. Now they don't explain it right here, but the evil, you know, they fell into evil. The evil that is mentioned here is explained in Judges chapter two, verse 11. And the evil is that the people had begun to worship Baal. Sometimes the people pronounce it Baal, but most people say Baal, but anyways, Baal worship, they fall into Baal worship, and Baal was a nature god um, whose worship included sexual immorality. And I want to make a little deviation here and explain a little bit about Baal, simply because we, we talk a lot about him when we're in, in the Old Testament. He's always mentioned, but rarely explained. Baal was a name given by Canaanites to local male deities considered responsible for the fertility of the land. The word Baal meant master or possessor or husband. When the Israelites entered Canaan, they found that every piece of land had its own deity or owner. This is why you uh, see many different gods having the word Baal as a prefix and the name of the place added to it, like Baal Gad or Baal Hammon or Baal Hazor or Baal Peor, okay? Eventually, the place names were dropped and the term Baal became a proper name for this particular fertility god. Now, the mythology of Baal describes him as a champion of the gods who battled the gods of chaos and destruction on the earth. This chaos was seen as drought and infertility among the people and animals or floods from the seas and rivers. And so Baal was a God of order and renewal in nature, responsible for the coming of spring and the growth and the reproduction that came with spring. They uh, uh, gave him this idea that this God was responsible for all of this. And so this ongoing battle among the gods was believed to be played out here on earth as the struggle for life seen in the cycle of seasons. And so this focus on life and fertility explains why this religion used temple prostitutes for ritualistic sex. It was believed that this type of activity empowered Baal in his battle with the forces of chaos. And so the stronger that he was, the more the chaos was overcome, the more fertile the land, the more fertile the animals and the people would be. So you can see the seduction of this kind of religion and the practice that came with it. For a people who depended on the size of their family and the number of animals they had and sufficient rain in an arid part of the world to survive, worshiping this type of nature God was natural and actually pleasing because of the practices involved with it. And so another character, God, that we hear about a lot when we read in the Old Testament is the goddess Ashtoreth. She was the female version of this same deity. And we see symbols of her in the use of the Asherah poles in pagan worship. So you'd have an altar to Baal and then you'd have a pole, you know, the Asherah pole next to it, kind of a husband and wife team or male female team there if you wish. Now, the Jews never completely abandoned worship to Jehovah, but rather they began to add the worship of Baal to their worship of God. And this is called syncretism. They worshiped the God of Abraham and they went to him in times of crisis. I mean, after all, it was the God of Abraham who had saved them mightily from the Egyptians and provided miraculously in the desert for 40 years. So they always went back to him when they were in a pinch. They praised and worshiped Baal as the everyday God who caused the rain to come and the people to multiply. That's the dichotomy of their worship system. 
This was easy to do given that by not eradicating the Canaanites as God had commanded them, they quickly were influenced by the pagan practices of Baal worship and the seductive idea of sexual activity wrapped in the cloak of religious practice. Can you imagine that? This was where we find ourselves in Judges chapter six. The people have practiced this type of idolatry in pursuing Baal worship for themselves. God has brought down a judgment on them in the form of attack from another nation. And so God punished them for this by allowing a neighboring people to come in and pillage their crops and livestock every single harvest season, year after year after year. After seven years, they cried out to God for help and heard their prayers and he heard their prayers and he decided to save them from the Midianites. And this is where Gideon comes in. So let's read and continue reading uh, in our passage in chapter six, this time from verse 11. It says, then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak tree, uh, excuse me, under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abuserite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has this, all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord looked at him and said, go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? He said to him, O oh Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh and I am the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat Midian as one man. So Gideon said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come back to you and bring out my offering and lay it before you. And he said, I will remain until you come. So we see uh, in this passage, we see uh, Gideon beating out wheat in a wine press. Wine press is where you, you, know, you press grapes to, to make wine. But you know, it was like a big uh, trough, if you wish, big round trough. And, uh, uh, you could climb into it and go down. So he was hiding from the enemy. In the, in the following chapters, we see the change that uh, Gideon's life takes as God calls him to save his people from the enemy, the Midianites. Now, uh, what I want to focus on this morning is the transformation in his life. His transformation from farmer to leader and the victory that he won, all of this came in different stages. And the book of Judges describes these from chapter six to eight. And we'll, read, we'll read little bits and parts as we go through the different stages. So what's the first stage? The first stage is he doubted his call. Isn't that familiar? You, you listen to people who, who God is calling, they always, who, me? You know, I'm, I'm not good, I'm not able to, I'm not, you know, I'm not worthy. It's always the first response. Well, he has a pretty, normal response, he doubted his call. So we read in verse 19, then Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour and he put the meat in a basket and broth in a pot and brought them out to him under the oak and uh, presented them. Uh, the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And um, he, uh, he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. The fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it is still an Ophrah of the Abuserites. So he doubted his call. When the angel first called him to be a leader and save his people, he pleaded that he was weak, he was insignificant. He, he wanted a sign at least, you know, give me a sign. 
After the angel miraculously burned up his sacrifice, Gideon accepted his call. Stage one. Stage two, he overcame family obstacles. No kidding. Who are the first ones against you when you have a bright idea? Who are the first ones to try to talk you out of it? Oh, no, but why? They know you, right? They know you. When I went into preaching, you know, oh boy, my family, what? They, they couldn't figure what that was, you know. My mother gave me two years. She said, ah, two years, you know, two years. I give you two years, I mean, your own mom, you know, she knew me. And if, if, if I was me looking at me back then, you know, I would have said the same thing. Oh yeah, I don't know how this guy's going to last, you know. So he had, he had some obstacles, right? He overcame them. We read in verse 20, uh, 25, it says, Now on the same night, the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and a second bull, seven years old, and pull down the author of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold in an orderly manner and take a second bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah, which you shall cut down. Then Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had spoken to him. And because he was too afraid of his father's household and the men of the city to do it by day, he did it by night. When the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was torn down and the Asherah which was beside it was cut down and the second bull was offered on the altar which uh, had been built. They said to one another, who did this thing? And when they searched about and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash did this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die for he has torn down the altar of Baal and indeed has cut down the Asherah which was beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal or will you deliver him? Whoever will plead for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a God, let him contend for himself because someone has torn down his altar. So Gideon's own father was a Baal worshiper, imagine. And so God tested him by asking him to destroy the idols in his own house first. <laughs> you want to be a savior? Start at your house. The result of this was that his father lost faith in these uh, idols, as therefore on that day, he named him Jerubbaal. That is to say, let Baal contend against him because he had torn down his altar. So the result is that his father lost faith in these idols and defended his son's action against the other Baal worshipers who were angry with Gideon. Basically, the father said, hey, if Baal is a God, let him defend himself. He doesn't need me to defend him. He doesn't need you to defend him. Third stage, third stage. He needed reassurance, really. He needed reassurance. It says in uh, verse uh, 33, then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the sons of, east, of the east assembled themselves and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. So the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and the Abzerites were called together to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh and they also were called together to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun and Naphtali and they came to meet him. Then Gideon said to God, if you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on the ground, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken. And it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not let your anger burn against me that I may speak once more. Please let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece and let there be dew on all the ground. And God did so that night for it was dry only on the fleece and dew uh, was on the ground. And so after successfully cleansing his own house uh, 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 God asks Gideon uh, to lead Israel against the Midianites. Whoa, wait a minute. It's one thing cutting down a pole and knocking down you know, a wooden altar or something like that. You know, that's one thing at my dad's house. You know. Now you actually want me to go to war. Now you know, there's a danger somebody's going to come up and actually kill me. You know, where these are professional soldiers. They're after us. You know. And so Gideon once again was unsure. 
and he asks for a sign which God gives him by providing dew on a sheepskin, it's a, you know, a fleece is a sheepskin, and on the ground as Gideon suggests. Yeah, isn't God good? I mean, I, you, know, you wonder about the patience of God, you know, the patience, you know, the small tiny steps we take and he waits, he waits, he waits. So then next stage, you know, he, he doubts his call, he overcomes the family obstacles, he needs reassurance. Next stage, he overcomes his fear. When he, didn't, uh, when he decided rather to lead the people against Midian, uh, the Bible tells us, too long a passage, I'll just summarize here, 22,000 show up for war. 22,000, we're ready to go to war. Of these, 10,000 of them leave because they were afraid to go to war. So that leaves them with 12,000 men. Uh, the remaining 12,000 are kind of winnowed down to only 300 by the Lord in various ways. So eventually, you know, his only army it starts with 22,000. He's down to 300 men now to go to, Lord, uh, to, go to war. Uh, he was outnumbered 500 to one by the Midianites. However, the Lord revealed to him that he would win the battle, nevertheless. And so Gideon, we know the story, surrounded the Midianite army uh, that was camping in a very deep valley. And in the night, his 300 men, each armed with a clay pot and a torch and a trumpet, they broke the pots and they blasted the trumpets and they began shouting war cries as if you know, they were attacking. The Midianites who feared that Israel had a great army panicked and in the darkness and confusion, they began attacking each other and they ran away in fear. Gideon captured the Midianite leaders and executed them, thus ending the Midianite threat. His fear of facing such a great army with so few men was overcome as the Lord allowed him to overhear how much the Midianite army was actually afraid of him. And that gave him courage to go ahead. Stage five in his transformation. He obeyed God. He obeyed God. Let's read verse 22 and 23, very interesting passage. It says, then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and your son, also your son's son, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. His finest hour, his finest moment right there. After his great victory, the people wanted Gideon to be a king over them. They felt he had earned it. Not only him, you, your son, your grandson, you know, a dynasty. Time to set up a royal dynasty. This was a great temptation. But Gideon resisted, remembering that God was the only king that the Jews had. And he, remembered, he reminded them of that by saying, the Lord shall rule over you. You only have one king, don't ever forget that. You know, brothers and sisters, sometimes when you're at the pinnacle of success, you are the most likely to fall. But Gideon managed to avoid this temptation by obeying God. When you're, you know, when you're having trouble choosing, deciding which way to go, which is right, Look for what God wants you to do. In other words, how can I obey God more perfectly? And that's the way to go. Stage, it goes on. It'd be nice, eh? we, the story ends here, happy ending, commercials go home. But the story doesn't end there. Stage six, he disobeyed God. He disobeyed God. In verses 24 to 32, we read, Yet Gideon said to them, I would request of you that each of you give me an earring from his spoil, for they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. They said, we will surely give them. So they spread out a garment and every one of them threw an earring there from his spoil. The weight of the gold earrings that the, he requested was 1700 shekels of gold beside the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple robes which were on the kings of Midian and besides their neck bands that were on their camel's necks. Gideon made it into an ephod and placed it in his city, Ophrah, and all Israel played the harlot with it there so that it became a snare to Gideon and his household. 
So Midian was subdued before the sons of Israel and they did not lift up their heads anymore. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Then Jerubbabel, uh, excuse me, Jerubbabel, the son of Joash went and lived in his own house. Now Gideon had 70 sons who were his direct descendants for he had many wives. His concubine who was in Shechem also bore him a son and he named him Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a ripe old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Abjazrites. In the end, Gideon replayed in his own life the cycle of obedience and disobedience that the, new, the Jewish nation had experienced throughout the centuries. What they had done century after century, he did in his own life, the same pattern. After his victories, he received gold as part of the spoils taken from the defeated Midianites. He took this and he made an ephod, which is a kind of a breastplate worn by kings or worn by the uh, priests. He also had many wives and a concubine to bear many sons. He did refuse to be king, but he acted like one. And his ephod was eventually seen as a kind of royal crest and held in honor by his people, his family, and they began to worship it. Eventually he died and after he died, the people fell back into idolatry as they had done before. His illegitimate son Abimelech started a civil war in order to gain power. Gideon was a great hero of the people, a judge of Israel called by God as well as a, a weak and a sinful man, all rolled into one person. His life, however, the good, the bad, provides several principles to guide our lives some 3000 years later. And here are the Gideon principles. Principle number one, our growth is in stages. Whether we're individuals or we're a church, whether we're young or older, our growth is always in stages. Gideon grew in stages as the Lord called him, then encouraged him, then challenged him again and repeatedly provided help and strength. I think of this congregation here, the Choctaw Church, Several decades ago, in 1939 to be exact, a few people were challenged to come out to Choctaw, the middle of nowhere, and preach in this area. And there was a, a, a gospel meeting that went on for a couple of weeks and they had several people who were baptized and many others who decided to come back into the service of the Lord. And they continued meeting outdoors in Choctaw, down, what is now downtown Choctaw. And they were meeting out there in a field in a tent and then the fall came and it was too cold and they had to make a decision. And so they tore down the tent and they rented a room on Main Street and they began meeting in that room in 1939, 1940 for, for many, many years. And so they planted a church and decided to stay. If we look back, every call to grow or step forward was always rewarded uh, when individuals uh, stepped forward and, and stood up and accepted the challenge. You know, many times as a church or as individuals, we are challenged by the Lord to step out in faith, to do something risky, to go beyond what we think we're capable of. And if we answer that call, he will bless us and he will encourage us. Growth is never a straight line up. People think, yeah, we're growing. We're, you know, it's always a straight line up. Growth is not a straight line up. Growth is a stair step. It's a stair step. There's steady work, there's steady work, there's steady work. Some of it's monotonous and repetitive. There's steady work and then whoa, all of a sudden a challenge appears and it, you, know, you got to go straight up. And the challenge can be all kinds of things. You know, it could be the COVID-19 thing. You know, that could be the challenge or it could be a personal illness or you lose a job or it could be a challenge to do something great or to step out or to, to take a risk or something. You know? But there's always a, there's always a challenge. Uh, it's not always positive, sometimes it's negative, but one thing for sure, it's always up. It's always up. We may be in our own lives uh, at the point of challenge in our period of history. That's why it's steep, that's why it's difficult. And it works like this, challenge, and then there's a period again of, you know, we, we, we consolidate and it's level. And we, we catch our breath and we, we continue to build on what we have, you know. But sooner or later, whether it's our personal life or our life as a congregation, whoa, there's another challenge. There's another uphill that's coming. And the same response is required. Uh, Gideon discovered that when we meet the challenge, 
when, when he responded to the call, God showed him that he would succeed. And so that principle has not changed in 3000 years. If we respond, if we are faithful to follow through, the Lord will bless us as well and we'll make it to the next plateau. Amen. Number two, Gideon principle number two. If God calls, he provides. I don't say you go somewhere that God hasn't called you to go to. You know, that you're on your own there. But if he calls you, he will provide. That's for sure. That's absolutely sure. In the situation with his father's idols, God provided protection from the unlikeliest source. And that was Gideon's own idolatrous father. Imagine, the last guy he thought would protect him. In the battle with the Midianites, despite the terrible odds, God provided a plan and the psychological edge that they needed to win against great odds. In the challenge to be king, God provided the wisdom to know how to answer the people without turning them against him and his household. God always provides. He always provides the right resources to do the job, enough resources to do the job, the wisdom to use the resources in the right way to do the job and the strength to push through difficulties. And so don't look at how big a project or a challenge might be. Don't focus on the weakness of the men and women who are working together. Don't worry about having enough to finish. Whether it's enough money, enough time, the bad weather, what people will say, you know, don't worry about that. Our job is to believe and trust in the Lord and His ability to make the challenge manageable. His ability to provide all those who will do it with wisdom to complete the task. His ability to provide enough, whatever enough of you need to finish, whatever that is. Finish a faithful life, whether your body is in shambles, doesn't matter. It's finishing your life faithfully that counts. So long as we're serving to God's glory and not our own, then the God who provided for Gideon's victory will also provide for our victory as well. That's our real challenge, to keep believing God. That's the challenge. Another principle, man is a mixture of good and bad. You see, God is perfect. Human beings are not perfect. Gideon did not have the revelation of Christ to enlighten him. He did not have the Holy Spirit to indwell him and he made tragic mistakes. We have, we on the other hand, we have the gospel, we have the Holy Spirit, but we still make mistakes. Such is the power of sin in our lives. Regardless of how noble our goal, how spiritual our intent, how badly we want to succeed to glorify God and obey his word, we're going to blow it as individuals and as a church from time to time. Despite his imperfections, God rewarded Gideon's efforts to serve him. I mean, the land did have peace for all of his life and he prospered and died peacefully and he was honored in God's word as a mighty servant of God, despite the failings that the word says about him. God knows that we are a mixture of good and bad. That's why he sent Jesus. That's why he is gracious with us. That's why he blesses our efforts to serve him. He knows us. I mean, really, he knows us intimately. He doesn't ask us for absolute perfection. I mean, Jesus has already accomplished this and offered it on, on, on our behalf. God asks us for perseverance. There's a difference. He doesn't ask for perfection. He asks for perseverance to persevere in faith, to persevere in hope, to persevere in love, one for another and for him. That's what he asks of us. And so in this time of challenge and social upheaval, let's not ask of each other what not even God asks of us. I've noticed that a lot of us require others to be perfect. Do you realize not even God requires us to be perfect? Why should we require that of each other? And worse still, why should we require that of ourselves? 
If God doesn't require it of me, why should I require it of me that I be perfect, that I never make any mistakes, that I never get it wrong, that everything is okay? It's never going to be okay. Let's be patient. Let's persevere with each other despite our imperfections and remain faithful to the church and the important task at hand. One brother came to me and he was all discouraged about the church and you know, people and uh, wish things were going better and all that business. And I said to him, what do you think do you get? How many people are we, you know, if, if, you, if everybody showed up, you know, everybody, we blew the trumpet, everybody had to be here, you know, what, 400 people maybe, a little over 400 people. Well, well what do you get when you take 400 sinners and put them all in the same building? What do you think you're going to get if you get 400 sinners and put them all together? Well, you're going to get trouble. That's what you're going to get. <laughs> it's only because of Jesus Christ that we can stand each other and stand ourselves. So after Gideon's day, the Jewish people continued the cycle of disobedience and rescue for hundreds of years until their final disobedience, which was the rejection of Christ which was punished by the destruction of Jerusalem at the hand of the Roman army. God did not rescue them this time, even when they called on him to do so. Many of our lives are like this, a continual cycle of promises and resolutions to do good or to reform our ways. And when things get better, we go right back to our old ways. God will always rescue you if you call on him in Jesus' name, even today, if you need forgiveness, if you need restoration, if you need prayer, if you need encouragement, if you need recognition, then we, we, we call upon the Lord uh, in baptism or in prayer and he will come to rescue you from what you need rescuing from this day. And so don't wait, don't wait until it's too late. One day it'll be too late while we have the opportunity to call on the Lord for rescue. Let's do that. We have that opportunity right at this moment as Harold will lead us in a song of encouragement. If you need to respond in some way, then we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing, shall we?